hospital port has pride and dignity. Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Panmo TV. Right, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to let you down a little bit, guys. Um, I know that, that today is another great reopening, and among other things that uh, can now open again, which couldn't before, I, uh, these included our cinemas. And of course I always said I would just go to the cinema, I had to go to the cinema, I really missed it, I want to go and see a film, I don't care what it is, I'll see any films. I, you know, someone said, you watched the Care Bear movie? I said yes. <laughs> but, well, um, that was a slight hyperbole, I'm not going to go and watch the Care Bear movie. There, there are a couple of like children's films, there's Peter Rabbit and things like that on. Um, no, I, mean, I, I was exaggerating slightly when I, would watch, when I said I would watch any film because I was so desperate to get back to the cinema. Uh, however, there are a couple of films that look quite good, um, and there's one in particular that I, that I could watch this week. Problem being, show times are much less than they used to be. I think they're just because of the restrictions that are still there, they can't like have quite as many showings. So they've only got like two showings a day, one one sort of matinee about one o'clock, and the other like eight forty p.m. or something like that. Now, neither of those times are suitable for me, unfortunately. Uh, the film I want to see is only being shown twice a day and I'm not available for either of those. Now, this might change on Friday because that's when the new schedule starts but um, until, t at least until Friday I'm not going to be able to return to the cinema. But I'm going to make it up to you. I will make it up to you because I'm going to do a non-roving film review. Another one, yes. Hopefully this will be the last. And I'm going to be reviewing a film called Toxic Skies. As always, I'm going in dry, as they, as they say in prison. <laughs> Don't ask me to explain that. But I, what I mean by that is I am going to um, not read any reviews of it. I'm not going to, I've watched the trailer, but apart from that, I'm not getting any input beforehand that will pollute my, my immediate impressions of this film. So I'm just going to watch the film, and then I'll tell you what I think about it, as I normally do. So with no, no further ado, it's time for me to um, not get myself to the cinema. I've got to get up and walk about two feet in that direction, sit in front of my computer and watch Toxic Skies. I know it's about chemtrails, that's all I know about it, so uh, there you go. So anyway, I will see you afterwards. Right, well I've just watched the movie, um, it's, well, it's similar in some ways to The Hunt for CM24, which I've mentioned before. Um, it's a, and it, it has that kind of B movie feel to it. I must say, um, the, I don't know how to describe it. Actually, it's something qualitative. You just go in there, you see lots of actors you've never seen before, people you don't know, people who are not very famous. This is not to uh, denigrate them for not being famous. Some, there's some really awful actors who are famous, but um, you can see that like, they've. It's quite a low budget thing. It has that. It has that slightly crew technical style. For example, you get lots of like, it seems to flick from one face shot to another face shot when you're having a conversation rather than having shots from other angles and things like that. Uh, which, you know, it's not exactly David Lean stuff, that's what I'm saying. It has that kind of, um, it has that slightly sort of homespun feel to it. Although obviously it's not like some amateur movie. It's not like some YouTube upload that I do, for example, because of course, you know, when it comes to sort of amateur, um, very amateurish kind of uh, sort of like not very, not caring or spending a lot of money or getting the details right. Well, you know where the point. Obviously, I'm guilty of that. If the word guilty is the right word, there's um, there's some. It's in some ways this is quite. It's quite sensitive and quite um, respectful to the idea of conspiracies and conspiracy theory. At the same time, it has. It has a lot of the usual cliches, but to give you a bit of background, it, it starts with um, the flashback 12 years earlier where a guy discovers something, he has some documentary evidence, and then he is suicided, as the saying goes. There will be spoilers in this review, by the way, so just uh, go and watch the movie now, if you can get it in various places, it's not hard to find, and, um, and then you can come back afterwards if you, if you don't want the spoilers, but I'm going to give you some spoilers here. Um, and it turns out uh, he, he is suicided after he discovers something. You don't know what that something is exactly. But then you flash forward 12 years to the present day, and there's his brother. His, his brother is actually working on various conspiracy theories. And this is where you get, like, 
you get to, he has a cork board now with, with with pictures and ribbons. He has cork board cork board and ribbons, which is like it's almost like a tin foil hat as the kind of stereotype. However, you know, of course, in the in the, the thing is, I don't know any conspiracy theorists who use cork boards. I mean, you don't really need them in the internet age. <laughs> it's but they're still there. I mean, they, you still get uh, the. The, the classic conspiratorial nerd, you know, with his cork board and with the ribbons, and um, tin, usually he's got a tin foil hat and that. But uh, <laughs> it's, it's like that, that song. I don't know if you've seen the, the the song and the video, the conspiracy theory guy. You know, it's quite that's quite funny, I must say. Anyway, but um, there's another another major character, the two, the two main characters. The other main character is Dr. Tess Martin, her name is, and she's an um, infection expert for, um, and she comes, she works for something called the Global Health Organization. It clear, obviously, I think they've changed the name for legal reasons, because of course you know what we're referring to. It's just, it's not the Global Health Organization. It's another word beginning with W that means global. Hmm. So uh, they're also, they don't want to get sued, obviously. But um, yeah, she's um, she suddenly finds out that people start coming down with. Um, th this is quite timely, actually, considering what's going on today. With it starts off with flu-like symptoms. A lot of people come into the hospital, into a local hospital, suffering from flu-like symptoms, and then it progresses further to other symptoms such as lesions on the skin and hemorrhaging and things like that which makes her think it's the bubonic plague or something like that but then then it turns out that it isn't. Now there's, a, I must say in this film there's a lot of inaccuracies regarding hospitals which you'd have to be in frontline healthcare to really to spot. For example they walk into this in quarantine ward with hazmat suits on uh, you've probably seen them in the news, where, where the, in the COVID wards, you know, and indeed they have them at my hospital. And then they, so they deal with patients that have this mysterious disease wearing these hazmat suits. Then they walk out through the through a normal door, and they just slip them off like they're raincoats. I'm like, what? You don't do that. I mean, I've this is something I've never done for real, but I drilled it many, many times. And of course, doctors and nurses and porters and other people are doing it for real now, which is that you. You have a, um, you have like a, a like a there's like a curtain and then inside the curtain there's a space, and in that space you've got to take off the suit the, that is usually consists of a mask. You've seen them on TV, the mask, the proper mask that is, which actually works. Um, something like covering your eyes, either goggles or like a visor, your hood, the hood and the rubber suit, the, 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 the plastic suit, the rubber gloves, the Wellingtons. You take them off without touching them. You put them in a bag, it's usually coloured red or yellow to indicate it's, has, it's like for disinfection or for disposal. And then you have to wash your hands and you have to step onto, an, 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 onto, a, onto a mat on the floor. And then you sometimes you have to have a shower, sometimes they have like a little shower stall there. Sometimes you can just put your old uniform back on again depending on the quarantine levels and the containment within the, within the ward. Then you just see them walking out, say, right, let's shove that off there, hang it on the hook over there, well, there you go. <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's, I mean, this is simple research, even though it's like, it's, I know it's a low budget, quite, it's not a very ambitious production, but they could have got that right. But then, you know, it's it's one of these things that I will maybe spot, which other people won't, you know. But um, anyway, this, this, uh, there's these two guys, there's this younger guy called Jack, who's a conspiracy theorist with a cork board. And there's another guy called Edgar, who's like this older guy. Who's obviously like his mentor, and he's got a cork board as well, and he does lectures. He does local lectures for people on chemtrails and things like that. But then you see Tess, Doctor Tess, is like this very straight-laced young woman who is. It turns out that she lost a child, and she misdiagnosed it when it was meningitis, and she um, she can't forgive herself for that. And that that element, that characterization, would have added a bit. Would have added a lot of depth to the character, and it does add a bit, but it's not really explored in any detail. There's a lot of strange. Um, what I would say puddle jumping issues to do with that character actually and um, I'll come to it a bit more in a, in a minute but anyway she wants a lockdown she, she sees this disease she wants a lockdown um, and she tries to trace the infection now the mayor of the town she lives in doesn't want that and he's like saying well no we mustn't there's nothing panic we mustn't panic I think you're being alarmist and things like this 
It turns out that then they have a national pandemic. I think this is the United States, this is set in or Canada. And they have like a national pandemic and it's to do with um, the fact that one of the one of the patients on the ward is an air stewardess. Oh, what's the politically correct term for that these days? I don't know. I don't know what you call them. Trolley dollies. I, I just you know, not trolley dollies, that's no, that that is extremely misogynistic. But you know what I mean. I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna look for some kind of special politically correct phrase. I say air stewardess. And that's that's the end of it. I don't think that's disrespectful. Hey, yeah, we got like um, um I must say the the character, all the characters are somewhat cookie cutter. You know, you have like they tend to you know these they, they, these these B movie these male B movie actors tend to all look the same. They're all sort of like uh, conventionally handsome with a full head of hair. Usually blue-eyed, always with a very sort of like uh, sophisticated sort of um, educated American accent. It's like, you know, I, I love Stephen King's The Mist. You know, the, the film Frank Darabont's adaptation of Stephen King's The Mist. But you know, the main character in it, the main the main male character, is just one of these bloody. He's just one of these kind of himbos, one of these clones, and you, you there's. Jack and the, one of the bad guys, a guy called Major Steen, they are like that as well. And that to me is a little bit, and indeed the older bad guys are the same, they're sort of like, you know, you get like the silver haired kind of suited person, you know, with a craggy face and a rather sort of furrowed brow. Now, don't get me wrong, I love Paul Verhoeven's Robocop, but I'm thinking specifically of Ronnie Cox as the, the, the bad guy in that. I can't remember the name of the character in Robocop, the bad guy. Ronnie Cox is the actor. Again, that's a kind of like a, a cliche. I think in the tone, in, in what, knowing Verhoeven and knowing what he does, that's, he probably deliberately included that as a, as a caricature rather than as just a cliche. He probably deliberately wanted to put someone in who was very, very textbook. But in the case of this film, they could have done better, I think. <clears throat> the, casting, the casting's not ideal, I would say. Um, and then what happens is... Um, Jack starts to Jack sort of like starts sneaking up on Tess like a stalker, but he's not stalking her. He's trying to get he's trying to convince her that there are conspiracy theories. There is there are conspiracy theories associated with chemtrails connected to this disease. Um, he, it's not entirely clear how he comes across her identity and what she's involved with, but you know that's one of the many that's many, one one of the many disbeliefs you have to suspend when you're watching this movie. Um, she just that she he tells her he gives her like a, a load of printouts on basically from sites like Apanwo really uh, about conspiracies and things like that to do with chemtrails and she starts googling it and she finds out there's this this big farm agricultural company called Kellor K K E W L O R and I'm thinking right this is getting good it's about half an hour into the movie it's a bit slow moving and I'm thinking right this is this is improving this film is improving um. And then she finds out from the nurse on, on the ward that they've discovered barium and aluminium in the blood samples of the patients, which of course is, as you know, if you watch Cliff Carnicum and these other people, you know that's a big sign of, of, of things that shouldn't be in the environment that are there now. We shouldn't have been there. You know. um, well, Tess then, um, Tess then starts Googling and finds these... Um, Finds out about chemtrails and stuff like that, and she discovers she she discovers that well, that a lot of the things to do with Keller and the chemtrails there's a connection because Ke Keller are providing additives to jet fuel, and this is then being sprayed out the back of aircraft. This, these additives cause there's something called E901, which causes uh, causes immune deficiency in in adult humans. And well, you know what she does? She she actually gets uh, clever, clever, clever young woman. She is. She goes and tells the mayor, the mayor of the city, and says, "Look, I've got proof that this is this is evidence or proof." She says of Keller um, being involved in this because the connection between Keller and the immune deficiency the patients are suffering. They're not responding to the antibiotics or anything, or the or antivirals or whatever they're giving them. And this um, and this particular company. And, the, and this particular pandemic, this virus. It seems it's not the virus, it's, the virus is not the cause. The actual origins of the virus are never actually explored in this film. 
all that's explored is the virus turns up and then people can't people can't def defend themselves against it as they have some form of immune deficiency um, there's there's many people who say this and indeed there's some interesting um, evidence that's been brought to bear by people like Dr. Len Horowitz that AIDS basically is this it's um, caused it's actually not a it's, it's the virus is actually a some kind of bioweapon which reduces people's immune system and it's it's a big subject I can't go into it now but do watch uh, Horowitz's film he's, he's done a long documentary it's three hours plus or so but it's worth watching all of it uh, in lies we trust the Hollywood CIA on bioterrorism it's definitely worth watching that but um, anyway um, then there's another there's another little element which I think there's several things happen in this film which make me think that the producers have watched the film conspiracy theory Richard Donner's film which is very good actually it's it, you think it, you, it, to begin with you think it's taking the mickeys uh, you have Mel Gibson as the star of it and he's like you know, he's in a taxi he's in a taxi and he's driving along at the, in the opening in the opening titles he's driving along lecturing his passengers on various conspiracy theories and that was actually ad-libbed by by um, Mel Gibson during the during the rehearsals and that was never in the script he ad-libbed it and Donna and Donna decided to put it in the movie and so they filmed him doing that. So, because uh, Mel Gibson's actually very much on our side, you know, he's very much a, a loony. He, well, he's, a, you know, tin foil hat wearing nutter, like like me, you know, to, call, if, to use that phrase. But that's what he is. Good luck to him, I say. Um, but he's basically, she gets into the car, and guess what? Jack is in the back seat, and he goes, he puts his hand over her mouth, says, "I'm not going to hurt you." You know, it, again, it's a bit. Uh, it's <laughs> I don't know how he actually got into the car, but. Um, And then he explains, he takes her to a cafe and explains that there's diseases everywhere on the rise. He mentions cancer, he mentions Alzheimer's, he mentions a couple of others, and he's diabetes. He says, there are 4,000 jet planes flying over our heads, either, I think this is the United States, putting, and he says, something's putting something in the fuel. It may be to do with population control, it may be to do with uh, making people dependent on the pharmaceutical industry, which would make sense in this, in a way, if you if you have if you can deplete someone's immune system, and you have you have drugs and you want to sell them to people who have bad immunity, then you could say, well, uh, who profits from the crime? It's the old police maxim, isn't it? But um, there's a there's another. Then Tess goes back to the hospital, and then one of the patients dies. And again, it's very unrealistic because she dies in the middle of the ward, and they try to save her. It's an open, it's an open plan ward with beds everywhere, and they don't put the screens round, because you know beds. If you if you've been in hospital, you know that beds have screens. They have like, you either have portable screens on wheels, like which are fabric curtains basically, or curtains hanging from the ceiling that you just draw around the entire bed. But then this patient is sort of like having a seizure and ends up dying right in the middle of the ward, and there's all these patients around watching, scaring them half to death. Again, unrealistic, unrealistic. Yeah. Um, also, a little, a little minor niggle. Um, Jack is followed home from the from the cafe by these two agents in black suits. You know, the typical sort of like uh, you know sinister sunglasses. No sunglasses. They have black suits, but they don't drive a black car. Aren't these guys supposed to drive black cars? Come on, come on. Maybe I'm getting too critical. Mm. And then the things. Um, then I think when people start realizing again. The people, like the mayor and Major Steen, who's this Major Steen is this guy's head of the, he's head of the lockdown because eventually a lockdown is declared and he basically is running the entire lockdown, putting roadblocks across the pathways, making sure people socially distance, keeping them in their homes, making sure they wear masks and things. I didn't, I didn't actually see anyone wearing masks, you know, like normal cloth masks. But I saw, you know, basically keeping people out of the area. Um, he then sits down, test, he sits down, test together with the mayor, and together with this other guy called Taylor, Mr. Taylor, who's um, head of this Keller, who's actually Keller, the pharmaceutical agency, actually supplies the hospital with drugs, so he's there too. And then they do exactly what happens in conspiracy theory of Richard Donner. If you remember um, Jerry Fletcher, the character, do watch Conspiracy Theory. Actually, it's a very good film. Jerry Fletcher is um, has a love interest who is this 
this lawyer, I've got the name of the character, played by Julia Roberts. And at one point they take her, the conspirators, take her to one side and they try to indoctrinate her against Fletcher. And they do this with Tess. They sit her down, they told her what happened, they said his brother committed suicide, look here's a picture of him in the bath with his wrist slashed, blood in the water, they show him the photograph, they show him how Jack's been arrested, they show how he's been influenced by this guy Edgar, who is a, a conspiracy, a major conspiracy person. And then they, um, and then they, so they, they basically make out, they say, they took, they, they show him basically, they show her, they show Tess, that this guy Jack is just, he's just a loony. And she calls, she swallows it hook, line and sinker, because when Jack goes, gets up to her next, next, when Jack goes up to her next, she says, oh, I've, I've learned all about you, you've been manipulating me, you're, you're not who you say you are, etc, etc. And this again, it's so they basically demonised Jack to Tess, so Tess now doesn't believe a word Jack says. But, um... Jack actually, um, this is where it gets a bit weird, because Jack finds a sample from an insider in the company, and then the, the men in black attack him, and they shoot at him, and things like he has to drive off in his car, um, he has to escape in his car, and they, they, they do, luckily the producers do avoid the cliche of the, uh, the, the men in black shooting at his car as he leaves and putting a, a bullet hole in the windscreen, they avoid that cliche, so credit to them for that. But um, again, we, he gets a bit silly because he's he's when, when he's shot, he is actually he does have like a, a flesh wound on his arm, and he goes to the hospital and Tess treats him, and she has to smuggle him out, and she she puts him on a on a trolley, and she puts a, a she puts a sheet over him as if he's a dead body, and pushes him down the corridor. Now, two things wrong with that. Firstly, um, th th you wouldn't get like. The one that doctors don't do that sort of thing. That sort of thing is done by porters. You know, this this kind of disposing of dead bodies is done by porters. Doctors don't have time to deal with the dead. They have to they have to try and save the living. It's up to porters. That's what porters are for, to do these sorts of things, so that doctors and nurses don't have to. That's the purpose of my profession. Um, also, they go down a public corridor where there's people in a waiting room. You you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that. And people used to joke about it sometimes. I mean, it went, sometimes staff used to joke about it, not just porters. One of the nurses said to me, you know, when, when we, we were doing this with a, with a, with a dead body, uh, could you wheel that through, go and wheel that through minus side waiting room, would you, Ben? Get rid of all the time wasters for us. <laughs> the joke being that um, if, um, if I wheel a dead body through the minus side A&E and all the people there are waiting, <laughs> the people who could, the, some of them will sort of get, they'll, they'll get rid of, there's a big long queue, they'll say, oh no, no, I'll go and see my GP, thank you, and they'll be scared out of the hospital. One of the surgeons joked about this once, he had some blood-soaked Wellingtons in, from theatre, and he said, I'll just walk through minus side A&E, get rid of all the time wasters. Mm. It's, um, it's sad, you know, but some people go to, some people go to hospitals, and I used to deal with this as an aside, there are certain there are a certain type of patient we get who just they're there all the time for some reason or another and they've always got some complaint and sometimes they just make things up and they turn up at A and E. Sometimes they go to their GP and they're referred to the they're referred to the surgical team because they they say they're suffering from st intense stomach pains, which is a sign of problems like things like uh, duodenal ulcers, appendicitis, things like that. Um, and the sad thing is they're they're just lonely people and they want to be cared for and no one else will do it, so they go to hospitals. It's, it's very sad. Um, I've met people on this. I've met, I've met people with multiple abdominal scars from when they've had, they've had investigative surgery. Because if someone turns up complaining of agonizing pain in their belly, what, there's only one thing you can really do, is that take them into the theatre, cut them open and see what's inside. And some people get addicted, they get addicted to the Obviously, the discomfort and pain of the operation they don't like, but they're willing to trade that off simply to have somebody care for them. Simply to be looked after. It's, it's, I don't know what the te technical medical term for it is, but it's an addiction to being in hospital. It's, I feel sorry for these people enormously. Where was I? I'm going straight off on a tangent. Oh yeah, I was talking about the, 
the, the doctor wheeling this dead body on a trolley through the hospital and yeah. um, then what's weird is Tess suddenly believes him Tess goes from the skeptic who firstly was skeptical to begin with then starts believing and then so but you know, she, she 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 goes from the person she scoffs when Jack hands her the papers she googles it and starts believing she tells the mayor the mayor tells her it's rubbish then Jack talks to her, her about it and she she goes back and then of course Major Steen and the and the mayor and everyone else they sit her down and give her the talking to to demonize to turn her against Jack to tell a lot of lies about Jack because of course Jack's brother didn't commit suicide he was suicided because he discovered about Keller and what they were doing with the jet fuel and then suddenly she believes him again and again this is another puddle jump we don't there's no real process about how she goes from one to the other that's a that's a major structural flaw in the story actually um, and they start saying well this is where it gets it gets a bit more I won't, I'll come to this in a minute but basically then Tess is kidnapped by the black van, van, van men um, and the, the samples are stolen by uh, Major Steen. Then, then Major the thing is then the samples are taken after she's kidnapped. The black the, the, the black van the the not black van men turn up in a black van. They kidnap her. They grab her and put a bag over her head and put her in the back of a van. Then she's taken in front of Major Steen. A Major Steen who is uh, again he's one of these cardboard cut out male characters. He. Um, he says something very interesting. He said, and this is where it gets a bit silly because well, it, it, the whole film is a bit silly, but it gets even more silly at this point. Major Steen announces he's not working for the people who shot Jack. That is the the people who turned who seem to be working for the Keller Company. But then he says something. He says something interesting. He says the government. He he says there is a government program to produce chemtrails chem to control climate change. This is one of the many stories about chemtrails. I mean, I've discussed this before. What what is the purpose of chemtrails? And um, it's there's theories about whether it's been used to as solar radiation management. And this is what Steen says. He says basically it's to reduce global warming. Now, this is not really a conspiracy theory because aeros high altitude aerosol spraying has been suggested for that very very purpose. Seriously. I've explained before how there was a there was a an episode of Tomorrow's World, the famous uh, science program on the BBC. There was an episode of Tomorrow's Tomorrow's World where they actually said they wanted to do this. They actually said this was a this was a proposal, reduce the so reduce the the solar radiation coming from the sky from the sun, hitting the earth, increasing the earth's albedo. That is the more it reflects more solar radiation. And one of the ways you could do this is by filling the atmosphere with vapor, a various kind of long-lasting vapor sprayed from high-altitude aircraft, and um, that it would reflect that sunlight, which so uh, cooling the earth down. And the the downside of it was, guess what? You would get a white sky instead of a blue sky. Well, what color is the sky after a major chemtrail? It's white. It goes white with high altitude vapor. So, so Steen says to Tess, "This is what we've been doing." But and we 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 contracted. So this is what we were doing. We contracted Kellor to provide the additives to the fuel. But it seems that Kellor have their own agenda. And their agenda is, he thinks, is for, to create immune deficiency to make people dependent on their drugs. So, uh, so we, so Tess and Jack then, then he lets Tess go, and Tess and Jack go to see Edgar, the old conspiracy theorist, the guy with the other chalkboard. And it gets a bit. What happens is, um, oh, for some somehow I couldn't quite work out how Tess ends up inside the headquarters of Kellor at the very same time that Jack breaks in there. Jack, Jack breaks into Kellogg, he's got a gun with him. Now first he's hiding from the security guard. Now I don't know whether I don't know whether this is for editorial purposes or maybe they didn't want to show it, but at one point Jack is hiding from the security guard. The next moment you see the security guard lying on the floor and Jack walking away. It's obvious Jack has killed him. Maybe they just didn't want to show that. Maybe it doesn't fit in with the character. I don't know, but it's, um, it's an unseen action within the film for some reason. 
but it's, they make it very obvious that Jack has killed this man to get in. And it gets a bit. What happens is Tess basically, when she's in the offices of this guy Taylor, who's the CEO of, he's the CEO of uh, Keller. She she then offers she then threatens him. <laughs> she says, um, "I've got all the, I've got all the dirt on you, basically. I've got the dirt on you. You better give you better tell me about the vaccine. We believe you've got the vaccine to the virus." Um, that how that happened to an, to an emergent virus we don't know please provide that vaccine immediately or I will go public with everything I know about Keller and what you've been doing with the, with the additives of the jet fuel and stuff like this and of course it's going to be backed up by Steen and the government um, oh and then Jack breaks into the office and starts a fight with Taylor. Taylor presses a panic button. The security guards arrive, and it's just um, and then it gets a bit silly because firstly, oh Taylor goes, oh that's important. I hope you've got some good lawyers and stuff like this. And then at the end, when basically the mayor, she calls the mayor. She managed to s secretly call the mayor on her phone while Taylor and Jack are having a fight, and she, Taylor basically confesses to. Taylor threatens him with a gun, then he threatens to pour this this, li this liquid over him that contains the, uh, the the chemical which causes immune deficiency. But then Taylor confesses everything on the phone to the mayor, and then the mayor calls the police, and the police rush in and arrest him. Now, this is where it gets a bit naive, because at that moment then it all comes out in the media. It all comes out in the media. Uh, Taylor's arrested. He's paraded in front of the cameras and everyone talks and the whole chemtrail secret is immediately released. It's very, very naive to think that would actually happen in real life. The conversation would really go very differently with Tess in the, in the, in the office trying to blackmail Taylor. What would really happen is he would laugh at her and say, what are you going to do? Go ahead, go public. Go, go, go public with all the so-called evidence you have against us. You'll be laughed into tinfoil hat town. You'll lose your job. You'll lose everything. You'll be kicked out of the global health organization as a doctor. You'll be struck off the medical register. You'll be la you'll be la you'll destroy yourself if you do that because we control the media. We control the lawyers. We control the police. We're the corporatocracy. You can't fight us. Some small town country doctor can't fight us and some conspiracy theorists can't fight us. And the, see, at the end it gets a bit better because the, the, the final scene of the film, you see Major Steen, obviously she, it, it's revealed at the end, or it's hinted that Major Steen actually is involved with the conspiracy to do with Keller. Because he's seen a new, another company comes along to sign a contract with the hospital and he sort of shakes his hand and he looks evil like that. And there's some sinister music playing in the background. Um, and of course... Along with along with uh, the confession by Taylor, thankfully at last the vaccine is released and everyone and that it's carried in the the nurse carries it in in this big box. You know, saying here's our vaccine, wonderful. So everyone gets the vaccine and everyone's happy. Which of course, as you know from what I've from my coronavirus videos, it wouldn't be like that, would it? It wouldn't be like that. It's this film is. I mean, I, I like to be positive, but you know, this this film was not really all that good. It had some good elements to it. I think the the ending is encouraging because the end it's slightly open ended. To to, to be, it's almost as if at the very in the last few minutes of the film, it's starting to go somewhere really interesting and really um, a bit more thought provoking, a bit more realistic, and then the film ends. So it's almost like they're setting you up for a sequel, which is a bit better, which indicates, yes, the government is in bed with the pharmaceutical industry, rather than, you know, it's like these rogue, these rogue, this rogue pharmaceutical company doing this evil thing with jet fuel, and, oh my God, we never knew, and all, so the moment they know, they get the police in and they arrest him. Would that really happen? Come on, guys. Be, be honest, do you really think that would happen? Yeah. It's uh, the the reality behind chemtrails. Whatever's going on, we I know that 
the uh, the Martin School in Oxford is is got a ge geoengineering program now. There's all kinds of things being discovered by people like Cliff Carnican and Sophia Smallstorm. Whatever's being done, it's being done with the consent of the state. They're involved. They have to be. To a certain level, definitely. And the academic institutions, they're acting as talent spotters, I believe. There's, there's more than enough reason to suspect that. But the idea that somehow all, all, we have to, all you have to do is find one bad guy get the word out, then they'll release the vaccine, which is a wonderful thing. And it can only do good. They actually, hold, Vaccines are things that pharmaceutical companies are holding back because they do good, but the pharma, big pharma doesn't want to do good. <coughs> it's the other way. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the complete opposite. This film, Toxic Skies, could, it could have been a good thrill. It, uh, when I first heard about this, I mean, I heard about it years ago. It's taken me this long to actually get around to watching it. But when I realised, suddenly saw there was a movie about chemtrails, I thought, fantastic! Hollywood are finally getting in on this. I mean, I hope they. I just said, I hope they do a good job in portraying this. And they, what they end up doing is quite a half-hearted. It's quite half-hearted, actually, what I've just seen. It starts off quite well, and, it, and I mean, it's possible it will red pill a few people, like you people start googling and stuff like that when they hear about it and they may learn more but the film itself it seems it seems the producers and writers are kind of reluctant there's a kind of reluctancy to really delve into what's behind this they want to make it some cheap tacky cheap tacky little thriller and they just they they jump over a few pit uh, a, a few uh, a few pitfalls, you might say. What they see as pitfalls, what I would see as great opportunities. And they jump over these great opportunities to produce a very, a really rather shallow and not very interesting B movie. I, um, I think this this film could have been really good. It could have been great. It does have some human interest elements to it, if you like that kind of thing. But in terms of its conspiratorial plot, it's very sh it's shallow, not to the point of non-existence and worthlessness, but it was, it's a wasted opportunity. It, it, this film was wasted. And I mean, anyone who explores chemtrails in any depth, could, anyone who knows much about it, could have, could have themselves written something much better than this. But anyway, let's see if the critics take a dim view of it too so let's see what the critics say well not a lot there are no mainstream reviews I can find of this this is Rotten Tomatoes here and you can see here there is no there are nothing on the aggregator from the critics here at all what you have here is a 26% audience score which is very low as you see uh, on the left hand side you see the most popular and least popular things here the you see the woman in the uh, something there is 27% only and um, so this is lower than the current popularity polls on Rotten Tomatoes. So it's obviously a very unpopular film with the audience. But um, now that's about all I can find on the mainstream. I have here found a blog re review here. This is from uh, somebody called Rental Rehab, where bad movies go to live. <laughs> and the, the title of this review is The Importance of Knowing You Suck. Nought out of four stars. There are numerous numerous threads on the internet that allege that Toxic Skies was banned from American theatres because of its controversial plot about giant drug corporations intentionally causing the world population to suffer from diminished immune system via contaminated airlines, chemtrails. So increasing their dependency on the drugs manufacturer products. Yeah, that's a good summary of the plot. Well, I've got news for you guys. Toxic Skies isn't the first film that suggests that big government, the military and big business are out to get us. Right, well, uh, Toxic Skies actually didn't suggest that. They just said that the uh, the big big business is out to get us and that uh, big government and the military are against them. <laughs> uh, every movie ever made for more examples of this. And now, it wasn't banned because it hit a little too close to the home. It was released because it was terrible. <laughs> Hollywood had to atone for the sins of Transformers 2, and part of the penance including holding back 
at least one travesty for wide release. The, uh, right, so, uh, well, maybe that's understandable, you know. It's, but anyway, the biggest problem with Toxic, toxic Skies, apart from wooden acting, unnatural dialogue and shitty script, is it doesn't have a good sense to be it doesn't have the good sense to be outrageously over the top in any way halfway decent disaster film demands yeah um i, I see what they mean there i do think i'll, I'll carry on go for it. it says making a good bad movie is an art form it's also akin to a game a little self-awareness that's actually true um a good example of this is i think get out which i have done a roving review of Get Out is an absolutely terrible film, which was made into a, it became enormously successful and received adulating praise from the critics and all the awards imaginable because it's decided to exploit the kind of um, the wokeism, wokest kind of milieu. So th that is true, actually. That is actually true. Hmm. So this person goes on, he gets really bad. He says here. I was the viewer watching Toxic Sky, Skies, bound by some masochistic duty to see this thing through to the end. I suffered from through the anxiety of the Anne star remaking vehicle. Oh, um, well, I did have to struggle to see this to the end, but it's it's not it's it is a, not a very memorable film, I must say. Yeah, um, it's it, but it, unlike this critic, I, I think. The, the problem I, the, my main problem I have with it it's not the it's not the subject matter and obviously technically it's very poor as well it's that the the subject matter could have been done could have been handled much better that it could have been as I said earlier it's an opportunity that could have really been used to do some good to make a really good fictionalization of the chemtrail situation and all the issues associated with it and it wasn't that's the biggest crime it didn't go there it didn't explore the whole issue in detail. I mean, no doubt some some wise guy in the conspiracy sphere is going to accuse the makers of Toxic Skies of being shills. And well, that's a big cliche I covered in my last video, didn't I? I don't think no, they don't think they're shills. I think they probably just, as I think this this guy said, you know, they, they didn't play the bad movie game right. They wanted they wanted to make it more simplistic because they thought that would make it more successful when in fact it, it doesn't it doesn't even appeal to the underground market in the way for example they live does because they live is not like a popular film in terms of the mainstream critics but it's got this massive kind of grassroots counterculture fan fan base a cult toxic skies could have had the same if only they'd done it better I mean, you can forgive i mean you see this what well, thing about they live is as with Toxic Skies, you know, the, the script and the drama and the acting is not the best. The, you know, the, 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 on those technical sides of things, it's not the best film in the world either. But thematically, it's, it's absolutely perfect because it has this kind of, it, it, has, it carries this kind of conceptual weight that gives it a value on top of everything else. And Toxic Skies doesn't even do that. And so that was my non-roving review of Toxic Skies, the movie. Um, I'd love to, there's more films I want to review, there's more films I want to look into, but I want to get back to the cinema, and believe me, I will get back there as soon as I can. Maybe not this week, if so, next week. I can't wait to give you guys a roving review. Um, the last one I did, I think, was Empire Strikes Back, which was well over a year ago now. Um, <clears throat> I just really... Or, when was it actually? It could have been during that sort of inter-lockdown period where cinemas were open a little bit, but I want to get back there properly, and, and it's great It's great cinemas are opening. It really, really is. And um, this is something, I, an experience that I have missed very badly. And so I will not delay. If As soon as they're open, as soon as there's something to see, which I can actually go and see, which is a, a timing which is convenient to me, I'll be there with my camera as usual and you'll get one of those fil those little films certainly definitely and um, there'll be lots more coming as well about certain subjects maybe I, I'll see if I can find something to do another live stream about in the meantime thank you all of you for watching Hapanwo TV hospital porters pride and dignity stop the new world order